Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is the author of the book Strong Inside, Andrew Marinus. Harry Wallace was a pioneer, a groundbreaker, a man who broke down a barrier which allowed others to walk through. And I would guess most of you never heard of Wallace, myself included. Well, that's changing. And it's changing because of the tireless work of author Andrew Marinus, who through years of research, interviews, and the dedication to the product, wrote a book entitled Strong Inside, Perry Wallace and the Collision of Race and Sports in the South. Wallace was the first African-American basketball player on scholarship in the history of the SEC. And with it came all the trials and tribulations you would imagine would come to a person of color in the late 60s, especially in the South. Marinus explores all of it in his book, which was released in December and is now on the New York Times bestseller list. Today, the Vanderbilt graduate joins me to talk about the reasons for pursuing the story, his relationship with Wallace, now a professor of law, and the impact his story has made. And it's next on Sports Files. Andrew, it's an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for making the time for us. So tell me where the idea to write the book came from. Well, it came about 25 years ago, really, wow. uh, if you look at it that way. I was a student at Vanderbilt in 1989, happened to read a magazine article, a student magazine article about Perry Wallace's first game at Mississippi State. And it, it set this scene of sort of a house of horrors, really, in terms of the racism that Perry encountered in the first half of this ball game. At halftime, he's with the teammate holding hands to gain the strength to go back on the court for the second half. I had arrived at Vanderbilt myself as a history major on a sports writing scholarship, didn't know much about the school, read this article and saw an opportunity to bring together things I was interested in, sports, history, and writing, and wrote a class paper about Perry Wallace and then came back to this idea eight years ago uh, and decided I wanted to write the biography of this civil rights and sports hero that most people know nothing about. So it's a quarter of a century in the making. You start off, there's a lull in between, yes. and then you pick it back up. So now you approach Perry. What's his reaction? It was fantastic. I emailed him and said, do you remember me from back in 89? And he said, yes. And I said, I'd like to write wow. this book about you. And he said, go for it. And you know, it was the best possible response I could have gotten. I wanted to be sure that he was willing to take the time to do the number of interviews and to recount these uh, experiences that he had uh, to do the book right. You know, and, and he was all for it. He's been incredibly helpful throughout the process of introducing me to friends or acquaintances he had that would be important for the book and sharing memories of even the most difficult uh, experiences he had as a pioneer in the SEC. In 67, when he decides to go to Vandy and play basketball, did he understand at that point what the historical ramifications were? He did to an extent. Um, Perry was an extremely well-read kid. Even as a young kid, he spent a lot of time at the library, you know, reading about history, reading about Jackie Robinson, you know, so he had an understanding of um, other pioneers. Nobody knew what it was going to be like, though. You know, I, there I have a scene in the book where he brings in a reporter from the Tennessean who's covered Vanderbilt and the SEC, and Perry and his basketball coach in high school and the athletic director all just pose the question, What's it going to be like if Perry chooses to uh, break the color barrier in the Southeastern Conference? He had an idea that it would be difficult, and he really didn't want to do it. He only went to Vanderbilt because of the engineering department, not to be a pioneer. More for the academics. More for the academics than right. the athletics. He wanted to get out of the South, go play in the Big Ten. He was recruited by UCLA. But in the end, it was the opportunity to get a great education, study engineering, which he was interested in. It, you know, and then he makes this courageous decision, despite the fact he's going to be a pioneer, not because of it. In your conversations with Perry about the racial tensions, we know in the entire country, certainly at that time, 
it was bad. In the South, it was worse. Mm -hmm. How bad was it, though, in Nashville? Well, one thing I really try to do uh, in the book is to place Perry's story in the context of the place and the times. It's not strictly a basketball book. Right. You know, there's, right. some, there's a lot of basketball in it. I love sports. But to me, uh, it, it comes to another level when I can make uh, clear that Perry's story fits into the context of civil rights. Nashville um, was the site of downtown lunch counter sit-ins in 1960. Perry had been a 12-year-old kid and went down and watched the sit-ins wow. at that time. Uh, it was not easy for him on campus. He was kicked out of a church across the street from the Vanderbilt campus before he took his very first day of classes. Uh, he talked about the loneliness that he and the other black students felt on campus where the fraternity and sorority system was still segregated, and so there are very few social outlets for him. And so he encountered difficulties on the road, as you would expect, in games through the Deep South, but it wasn't a whole lot easier for him even on, on campus in Nashville. Andrew, why did Vandy feel it was the right time to reach out and to have an African-American play a sport. Sure. Well, it goes back to the same 1960 sit-ins. Uh, at that time, it was a Vanderbilt Divinity student, Reverend James Lawson, who has a history here in Memphis right, as well, right. who was, uh, he was a Vandy student at the time, leading the downtown uh, lunch counter sit-ins with other uh, African-American students in Nashville. When Vanderbilt administrators found out it was one of their own students, they expelled him from the university. Wow. It was a tr uh, tremendously embarrassing uh, moment for the school at a national level. They bring in a new chancellor, Alexander Hurd, who's a much more progressive figure and understood that race was the central issue facing the country at the time. And he was also a huge sports fan. And he knew that uh, the role that sports plays in American culture. And he felt that if he made a move in the athletic realm to show that Vanderbilt was changing, people would notice. So he encouraged the basketball coach to recruit a black player. And that's where the uh, impetus came from at the Vanderbilt side. As an author, as a writer, how tough is it for you in 2014, in the world we live in now, political correctness, mm -hmm. to refer back to a time when the N-word was used often at Perry, yes. and uh, obviously the, the, the hatred of a person just for their skin color? How do you convey that into the book? Uh, truthfully. You know, uh, I want people to feel that they're in Perry Wallace's shoes, that they're seeing the world through his eyes in the book. And so if they said it, I write it in the book. You know, uh, he, the professors at Vanderbilt used the N-word to Perry and to his uh, friends when um, Perry Wallace went down to uh, Mississippi to play the first game in Oxford that an African-American had ever played in. He was afraid he was going to get shot and killed on the wow. court or around town before the game. And I didn't want to, you know, cover up the truth of anything, you know, whether it was at Vanderbilt or anywhere else around the SEC. I tried to tell it exactly the way it happened. Did it ever get physical? I know verbally he was abused. Mm -hmm. Physically, did people go after Perry? Uh, I uh, recount one scene in that Ole Miss game. In the first half, Perry's elbowed in the face. His teammates told me they believed it was intentional. He's bleeding from the nose. He's temporarily blinded in one eye. Uh, the referees don't call a foul. They don't whistle a stop even to the game. So it's not till the next dead ball that the uh, student manager and team trainer are able to come out on the court to treat him. They walk him across the court to the Vanderbilt locker room, and the crowd rises and cheers the fact that Perry Wallace has been injured. Wow. Um, there weren't, uh, he, he faced, you know, the sort of the typical uh, under the basket types of physicality, but there weren't, uh, um, you know, many episodes like that, but that was the most stark example. He is a pioneer, but does he consider himself a pioneer? He does. He's not someone that seeks out the spotlight. You know, uh, if you go to his office now, he's a professor of law at American University in Washington, D.C. There's not a single, uh, athletic picture, you know, game action shot or trophy. You would have no idea that he played college wow. sports. But at the same time, he's proud of the history he made. He hopes that people will learn from it. And if you ask him a question about it, he's more than happy to talk about it. But he's just not the type of person with a big ego that goes around uh, telling people who aren't asking. I imagine he opened the door for many other African Americans. How quickly after Perry did we start to see more? In the basketball in the SEC, it was slow. So he only played against one of their black players his entire four-year career wow. at Vanderbilt. It was Henry Harris at Auburn. Um, by the mid-70s or early 72, uh, 73, C.M. Newton at the University of Alabama sure. had the first all-black starting lineup in the SEC and won three straight uh, SEC championships. Uh, football was integrating around the same time as Perry. Kentucky was the first school, and uh, others followed quickly behind. It was by the... Uh, early 70s, everybody in the league had started to integrate. 
What was the most fascinating thing you learned about Perry or, or just anything in your research for the book? Well, one thing that most people aren't aware of uh, even today is that the, the slam dunk was banned for a period in college basketball. And when they are aware of it, they refer to it as the Lou Alcindor rule, right. as if it was all direct, uh, you know, uh, aimed at Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. But I make the case in the book that this rule had a lot to do with Perry Wallace, who was taught to dunk by David Latin, who goes on to be a star of the Texas Western team that beats Kentucky in the 66 Glory Road Championship All African-American team versus all white team. Yes. Starting lineup. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And when Perry was 12 years old, Latin had started his career in Nashville at Tennessee State before he transferred to Texas Western. How about that? He taught Perry Wallace how to dunk. And so the year after that t Glory Road game, Perry plays a, a freshman game against Kentucky and dunks over uh, Dan Issel a year after David Latin had dunked over Pat Riley. Rupp goes crazy in both games, at David Latin's dunk and at Perry Wallace's dunk on the sideline. The next year, before Wallace's first year on the Vanderbilt varsity, the slam dunk is outlawed in college basketball, and Adolph Rupp is essentially running the rules committee. So you think it's Wallace? Yeah, he's going to have wow. to, because Rupp wasn't playing UCLA every year, but he was going to have to play Vanderbilt twice a year. And so, uh, you know, I'll make the case in the book that Perry Wallace had a lot to do with this. No question. What was the hardest thing about writing the book? Uh, the time. I did it uh, at night and on weekends outside of my uh, job in Nashville. I had got married and had two kids in the midst of writing the book, too. It's so, time consuming. <laughs> yeah. So it took eight years. Uh, pretty much every spare second I had outside of family and, and my, my day job was spent on the book. But I loved it. Every uh, second that I worked on research or interviewing 85 plus people for the book was great fun for me. I know you're very proud. It's been very well received, strong inside. As you know, currently on the New York Times bestseller list for sports and civil rights. Proud Papa, right? Oh, absolutely. Yes. That's a tremendously gratifying for me. What do you hear when people email you or text you? What are they saying about the book? Uh, the most gratifying uh, emails or calls or conversations I have are from people who were classmates of Perry Wallace's uh, from 66 to 70 at Vanderbilt who will say, um, you know, you got it right in describing the scene at the school and um, that I wish I had known more about what Perry was going through. We had a, an event in Nashville uh, when the book first came out. 400 people turned out, waited in line for two hours to see Perry afterwards, many of them with tears in their eyes, saying, Perry, I wish that I had been there for you when you needed it, you know, 45 years ago. And that's been just uh, amazing for me to hear those stories. What has been his reaction to the book, to the finished product? Yeah, it's been great. Uh, we did some events together in D.C. and in Nashville. And, you know, it's hard to speak for someone else, but I, I can tell that Perry's, um, you know, he's happy with the book. He's happy with the reaction to the book. And I feel in some ways now that the story is out there and people know exactly what he went through, it, it, it's a bit of a, um, bur a releasing a burden for him, you know, that right. he's been carrying right. pretty much himself for almost a half century. And now, you know, so many other people know the story. In all your research and all the people you interviewed, were there people that were upset that he was getting his chance? Were there people that were against what happened with his crossover into what was basically a white world playing basketball at Vanderbilt and in the Southeastern Conference? Uh, there were some, and there were a few people I wanted to talk to that didn't want to be interviewed for the book. Um, one thing that was surprising to me was that there were some uh, African-American classmates he had in high school and neighbors that were against him going to Vanderbilt. You know, uh, What was the so reason? That they would call him a sellout. You know, and you're going to this white school and that they would have preferred that he had gone to Tennessee State or to Fisk. You know, this was in the late 60s and the Black Power Movement was strong and that they felt that he was being used by Vanderbilt, even would call him an Uncle Tom at times, you know. And, wow. Um, so he was facing uh, pressures from all sides. So they didn't understand really the ramifications of the integration and what it would mean going down the road, going down the road. Some people, you know, it's not like this was the overriding sentiment, but there definitely was a pocket and they maybe understood, but they had seen in other cases what had happened to it with integration wasn't always um, for the best in the African-American community. You know, there was a part of uh, Nashville that was being destroyed to create an interstate, you know, which was billed as good for all of us, but it was um, ruining Jefferson Street, which was the primary commercial corridor of North Nashville. Mm. Negro League Baseball, you know, would say it's a good thing that Jackie Robinson came along and the major leagues were integrated, but it meant the demise of a strong black-owned institution, the Negro Leagues, you know. So there were complicated factors at play, even uh, with something that's, you know, an inarguably good integration. You were recently on a panel in Oxford at Ole Miss. I'm sure you've yes. been on a number of panels. What would you say the 
one question that you hear the most about the book? Who was Perry Wallace? You know, uh, I mean, that's a b basic question, but and it's one that I'm proud to answer, you know, and I'm surprised. It's a shame, really, that here it's 45 years later after this Jackie Robinson of the SEC, one of the most popular sports leagues in the country, that no one has any idea who this man was. You know, and he's the smartest, most sensitive, uh, thoughtful person that I've ever been around. He's an incredibly special person who went through the most difficult times you could imagine. And it's a real honor for me to tell his story to people who haven't heard it. Andrew, how can people pick up this book? Uh, they, thank you for asking. They can uh, Google Strong Inside. You can go, it's available on Amazon or barnesandnoble.com here in Memphis. You can go to the booksellers at Laurelwood, and I know they have it. Other bookstores can order it. If they don't have it, uh, you can visit my website, andrewmarinus.com, and find information there as well. Andrew, we certainly appreciate you being with us. The interview about Strong Inside is over, but we are not complete our interview because each and every guest I have, we do something called Five for the Road to okay. wrap up our interview. We want to learn a little bit more about you. Okay. So first thing that comes to mind, mm -hmm. simple questions about sports. All right. Favorite professional sports team? Milwaukee Brewers. Why? <laughs> I'm originally from Madison, Wisconsin. There we go. 82 Brewers are my team. Favorite professional athlete of all time? Uh, well, sticking with the Brewers, Paul Molitor was my favorite player growing my up. My son's favorite as well. How about that? Really? Yes. Yeah, I went to his Hall of Fame induction in Cooperstown. Wow, good for you. <laughs> Favorite music? What do you like to listen to, or a group, or a band? Well, one thing I'll say, it relates to the book, is I was trying to immerse myself in the era that I was writing about, so I kept my car radio tuned to the 60s station on Sirius XM, and Otis Redding actually played his basically his last big concert before he uh, died in the plane crash at Memorial Gym at Vanderbilt. So wow. uh, Perry was there to see it. I'll go with Otis Redding. Okay. Favorite movie of all time? Uh, the Usual Suspects. Maybe it'll be a strong inside. Yeah, yeah, maybe someday. Up. And then your favorite television show of all, of all time. time. Yeah, what do you like to watch? Wow, uh, probably uh, SVU, Law and Order, SVU. One of those, right? Yeah, there's one like, of those Law like and Order shows. There's a hundred Law and Order shows. Real quick, what's next for you? Well, you mentioned a movie. I'm pursuing everything I possibly can with this book. I've had some interest in a play based on Perry Wallace's wow. life. I have had a couple calls about a uh, 30 for 30 type of documentary on Perry or a movie. So I'm going to try to sense. just ride this out as long as I can. I'd love to write another book, and I'm, I'm waiting for the right topic to hit me. Andrew, an absolute pleasure. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much. We'll take a short break. Overtime is next. Next week, the Masters will take place at Augusta National, the golf season's first major tournament. Now, it's hard to get into a golf frame of mind with the way the weather has been, but things will undoubtedly get better. Closer to home, the 2015 FedEx St. Jude Classic will take place the second week of June. And back to defend his title is Ben Crane, who was sensational in winning last year's event. And just last week, Crane was in Memphis for the Champions Luncheon, and we were able to catch up with him. I'm Matt Paul of FedEx and also St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Congratulations, Matt. Here you go, bud. What was it that, that, that everything fell into place last year for you to win? Yeah, last year was just a special week. You know, normally you can kind of see it coming. You feel like maybe you have a 35th place and a 10th place, and then all of a sudden, boom, you know, you break through and you, your game's kind of last year was not like that. It was just kind of out of the blue. Uh, we, uh, you know how golf is. It's a funny game. You get one little thing that kind of works and helps, and um, and so that happened last year uh, here at this tournament. Um, I was not playing well all year, really struggling with my game, and um, just tried to simplify some things and and really just start doing a lot of mental imagery work um, at nights before I'd come out. And I came out the first day. I think I shot seven or eight under and grabbed the lead and was able to maintain that lead and and uh, lead wire to wire and and win the tournament. So. It was a special win, and you know that's that's my fifth win on the PJ Tour. And I'll tell you what, one thing I've learned is you never know if there's going to be another one. And so when you have a win like that, you celebrate. So we went home. We uh, we had called about 80 of our friends. We got a couple food trucks. We called a DJ and put bounce houses out in the yard. And we just celebrated like, hey, everybody, come over. It just, I mean, like, so it was uh, it was it was a special special week, and we we celebrated and really enjoyed it.
Yeah, winning on the tour is tough because there's a lot of good guys out there. Do you have a strategy this year for the season or for the tournament? Well, I've been battling some injuries with my right hip and I'm just starting to get healthy. So um, the strategy was just get healthy. And now, um, you know, the strength of my game is putting. And so I, I just need to make sure I maintain that strength, whatever. And then you try to um, improve your ball striking, you know, a little little pieces here and there. But you can't leave your strength. So my, uh, my plan is just to, you know, like when I come back here, these are some of the best greens on tour. This is one of the best courses we play. Uh, it's just to have my putting sharp. So really make sure you feel comfortable on those breaking putts. And, um, you know, you get a lot of speedy putts around uh, south wind, you know, downhill, down grainers, and you got to be careful. And, and so um, just make sure I'm sharp around the greens is really something that, that uh, sets you apart on this golf course. Ben Crane here for this event. Tell me about what's going on. Well, we, we're very excited to have Ben Crane back in Memphis. You know, he moved to Nashville recently. So he's uh, now a Tennessean um, down here visiting with a lot of our volunteers, having media interviews. Our Champions Day is always an event that we look forward to every year. It sort of kicks off the marketing season for us. So uh, very, very happy that the weather turned off pretty. We're in Overton Square and having a great time. He said this was one of his favorite places. Uh, you know, you win, that, that makes it pretty pretty fun. Yeah, he, you know, he, he, uh, he had a great year last year. He loves the kids of St. Jude. In fact, Ben is the third straight champion to attend a St. Jude event during the week. So there's, there's some St. Jude magic there for sure, and we're very proud to have Ben as our champion. So what do we got uh, looking forward to this year? Well, the tournament is now 60, 70 days away. Um, the grass is starting to green up. We've already gotten some strong indication from players that are partial to Memphis, like Phil Mickelson and uh, Dustin Johnson, uh, Webb Simpson, Zach Johnson. So um, with Ben leading the way, it's uh, we're in for a banner year for sure. And I'm really proud as a fellow Tennessean to honor you today and thank you for your incredible contributions to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And if you could come on up here, I want to unveil something here and turn this over to you. There you go, celebrating your great victory here at the FedEx St. Jude Classic. Winning on the PGA Tour is not easy on a, a yearly basis. And tell us about the week. Give these people here just a, a little idea of what it meant to you. First of all, I wasn't playing great at the time going up into the tournament. It wasn't like I'd finished 35th and 8th and all of a sudden, you know, came here and and won. It, was, I, it wasn't like that. I, I wasn't playing that great. But I get out to this big lead, playing great, and, um, and I've got 30 holes to play on Sunday. And, um, and so I'm thinking, you know, it's a, this is a good time to go to bed early and uh, get a lot of sleep, get ready, you know, to try to win a tournament and play the last 30 holes. And so I go to bed about 8.30 or 9 o'clock. At 3 or 4 in the morning, I call my wife and I said, babe, I haven't slept a wink. I am so nervous. I am scared to death. And I hadn't been playing well. And I want to, I'd like to win this tournament. And, um, and I called her. I said, babe, I've been up all night praying. I'm kind of tired of praying right now. Can you take over? She's at home. And maybe then I'll be able to sleep. They're all special in their own way. But um, the last one was just unexpected and, and um, such an incredible uh, you know, thing. And my caddy, I just, you know, I got to celebrate with my caddy who just, I just seen working hard for a couple of years and it was just really, we weren't making a lot of progress. And then to, you know, just say thank you like that, you know, was, uh, was really special. So, um, yeah, it's probably, probably my favorite. Not a bad paycheck either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then they, you know, they hand you a check for a, a big cardboard check that says, you know, a million, $44,000 and you kind of go, man. I mean, so uh, it's fun. Put you in a higher tax bracket. Yeah, exactly. We don't mind that a bit, though. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing Ben again come June. It'll be a busy sports weekend in the Memphis area, starting with the St. Louis Cardinals facing the Memphis Redbirds tomorrow night in an exhibition game at a refurbished AutoZone Park. The contest is slated for a 6.05 start. Hopefully, Mother Nature will come through. 
From there, the Cards will head to Chicago to open the regular season with the Cubs Sunday night, while the Redbirds begin play next Thursday at the Zone versus the I-Cubs. Also tomorrow night, the Grizzlies continue their four-game homestand with a showdown against Russell Westbrook and Oklahoma City. The Grizz will follow that up Saturday night with a home tangle with Washington. And for all you ice hockey fans, the River Kings are underway in the Southern Professional Hockey League playoffs. The Kings in Pensacola opened up their best of three first round series last night in Florida and will face off against each other tomorrow night at the Lander Center in South Haven in game number two. And that'll do it for now. Make sure to check out all of our previous shows on our website at WKNO.org. Have a great week, happy Easter, and happy Passover, and we'll see you next time. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO.